It's like running naked through a cornfield backwards at midnight. Hey, it's me. I just wanted to add here at the beginning... This episode was recorded about two weeks ago, and then life got in the way for a while. So Biden hadn't had his hemming and hawing and not really doing anything about uh, Israel-Palestine, the Israel rocket attacks, oppression, occupation that is going on over there. Anyway, similarly, there hasn't really been a lot of progress on the infrastructure debate. The Republicans have gone up to almost around half of what the original suggestion was on that. So probably a couple other things we wanted to miss, but largely I just wanted to pop in and say that shit show hadn't set off yet and forgive a couple weeks of hindsight onto this. This is a regular episode for Psychosemantic anyway, but there's going to be some more movie talk and discussion going on as we settle into the summer. Enjoy the rest of the episode. We will have more prompt criticisms of this administration, and thank you for bearing with me. But here's me in court a few weeks ago, before some things happened, but after others had already happened. Flashback. So are you recording yet? Yes, but I don't have to be. (laughs) No, it's totally fine. Welcome to another Psycho-Semantic podcast. You probably recognize that voice on the other side of mine, but that is Mr. Court Psyops back again. I am Darren, who is always here so far. I'm not saying there won't ever be. It would be weird if there was an episode without me, but nothing's definite, except for Mitch McConnell will never (laughs) die. (coughs) Oh, don't say that. No, it's going to happen. He's mortal. Just because he's a turtle and he's going to have an exceptionally long life does not mean he won't die. That will happen. And hopefully within both of our lifetimes so that we can take a road trip to piss on his grave because yeah. the pandemic's ending, right? Like, it's it's all over now, right? I mean, the rest of the world might be dying off, but, like, we're getting vaccinated, so things are cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what, 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 what we really want to talk about or what I, I approached you because I needed to kind of just lay some stuff out. And I'm like, you know, didn't we do 100 days for Trump? Shouldn't we do a first 100 days for Biden? Like, you know, to be fair and balanced. I think that's basically how I phrased it, right? It was something like that. I, I'm i sure we did something. I mean, with Trump, it was like... Every five days, we had something to bitch about. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was, holy fuck, wait, okay. And the way people were just moving past everything like that, it was like if we didn't talk about it then, it was gone until he did it again. <sighs> yeah, it was like the next day, there's like five more tweets that could possibly have ended the world and make you wonder why the fuck that maniac had their finger on the button. I'll tell you what, man, my stress levels and my worry and my fear has gone down significantly just because Joe is so sleepy and hasn't done a thing, right? Nothing's changed the whole time he's been in office. Uh, it's time for court to eat a little crow, I think. <laughs> well, welcome to the smorgasbord and soapbox well, I, all podcasts are soapboxes. So soapbox surfing. That's what you want. Soapbox you surfing. Yeah, I well, I think we kind of have to try. But I think a decent amount of people are like, now he's not going to complain about Biden because Biden's not Trump. That's not true. But I think if Trump ever did anything good, which if he did, but we consider accident. good. Let's be fair, because there are. Yeah. Yeah. There are some yeah. people that would believe that the things that Trump did were good. And those people also think that Q is like a real thing that they're a part of and that they're doing something good. Also known as morons. Yeah, all, those, <laughs> all those people in groups that are led by people who have been arrested for child pornography, fighting child pornography, they think. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you if you fail to see the irony of the situation that you are in when you are living satire written by a deity who's laughing at you like he's Terry fucking Pratchett. <laughs> you, you just don't fucking get it, right? Like, like, like you just, you, you're just not going to be there. Now, there's some things that Biden is doing or some things that Biden has said, and there's a few things that he's promised that he has yet to deliver on, but 
Uh, he's doing a slow and steady of a lot of the stuff that I said was just going to be artifice or that I was saying I was fearing that I was I was saying that I was fearing that this was just going to be, you know, this got him into office and there's not going to be enough to re- like push it. And both telling me, no, this is going to be the most progressive presidency we've had at least since FDR. And so far, knock on this wood that is the desk for for my my studio here. He's slowly but steadily bringing this stuff out. But the most important thing to me, the part that I like the most about the way that he's doing this is that he is taking people that he knows will do what is the right thing, like morally speaking, and he's putting them into the positions to do the thing that is right. And then he is stepping back. I'm speaking specifically of the DOJ because that's in my mind right now. I mean, that can anyone argue Merrick Garland's... It, can anybody argue Merrick Garland's like capability of running the DOJ and being a fair and balanced? Well, yeah, they're probably Republicans because they're going to say that regardless. But I mean, this was a justice whose record is impeccable. <laughs> you know, like the only reason he didn't get a vote is because they couldn't find anything to really oppose him other than let's just not vote on it. That's what Mitch McConnell's strategy was. Pure and simple. <laughs> exactly. All the senators that, uh, speaking of people that are unaware of themselves, and that might become a theme. Well, that is kind of a theme, especially when we talk about the Republican Party and the Democrats also. <laughs> we can talk about, we, we'll see where we get. But anyway, trying to stay closer to one track. Um, yeah, the trees for chainsaw parties. That's what the GOP is. <laughs> <laughs> So many of those senators that were had no problem totally denying the process when Merrick Garland was nominated for the Supreme Court had given him glowing reviews very recently, right before that, when he was appointed to something else. I like that he's changed his mind on uh, the death penalty because he used to be very pro-death penalty and now he's not. Are you talking Garland? Yes. See, I go back and forth on the death penalty. The main reason I'm opposed to it is I'm terrified I'm going to get it someday. Well, I mean, today, another guy who was executed four years ago just had DNA evidence come out that implicates somebody else. That That's is... the other part that I have a problem with it. You need to have 100 percent like like unimpeccable conviction, like before you execute someone, you know, like it, it has to be like, you know, it has to be like. 100%. Like, you can even put it in a fast lane. If, like, five people definitely witness this happening, there's DNA evidence that directly links it, and it's on video. Like, I don't know, a cop leans on a guy's neck for, like, nine or so odd minutes, and there's plenty of people around that see it, and it's, like, all around the world, broadcast on video for whatever reason. Like, that guy could probably get the death penalty for such a heinous and grotesque act. I think a lot more, a lot fewer people would argue with you about that. Than, than general. Uh, yeah, but because because he's a cop, when he was doing it, the blue line just heads just fucking exploded, right? <laughs> but if it wasn't a cop, they would be like, "Yeah, that was horrific. That was monstrous. That's murder." Yeah, I, I think it's pretty obvious that if somebody had knelt on a cop's neck for ten minutes until he died, things would have gone differently. There'd probably already be a national park named after the victim. Oh, yeah, he'd be an unsung fucking hero. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, The Vanessa is who you should really talk to about the death penalty because it's one of her passions. Uh, yeah, see, I freely admit that um, I have leftover baggage and a whole lot of rage that makes me like the idea of just being able to execute fuckers. But I don't like the idea that there is a mechanism put into place that makes it so fucking easy to do. In, in our it needs to be reformed in the very least. But I, I I get where the other side of it gets argued for sure for, for completely abolishing it. And now you're saying that Merrick Garland has switched sides on that and has decided against because he was pro. Is that what you're saying? He's at least not as adamant about it. OK, so uh, when he got nominated for the Supreme Court, I looked into him a little bit and then. When he was totally denied the process of that nomination, even though I am told that the Republican Party does not like it when a political party changes the size of of the court. They're very much against that, except for when they do it. 
They're uh, very much against anything that can make it even whenever they stack the deck in their favor. That's all it is. That's why they're voter suppressing. That's why they're screaming about the courts right now. That's why they freak out about the fucking deficit, because it's just a way for them to slow shit down and keep it exactly the way that they want it to be, which is grinding away at capitalism with all of our lives being the fucking lubrication from our blood. Yeah. So, I mean, he's still a cop. OK, he's still part of the justice system which needs overhauled <laughs> to say the least but yeah from I'm not the stances i mean uh, back in the 90s i mean he was who went after timothy mcveigh after the oklahoma city bombing uh, yeah this is why i got excited about him getting put into this because he's an expert on tracking down white supremacists and domestic terrorism and biden saw that coming in as an absolute threat, which he very justifiably should have. And putting someone like that as your fucking bulldog in charge of it, that you then step back and go, chains off, he's trained, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, you go do the thing, let's actually separate the powers. Which, at, right. at, least, at least visually. And it doesn't seem, I mean, it really seems like, I mean, I don't know. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get into it. Uh, <laughs> This is Biden not... just doesn't appear to me to be the kind of person that doesn't respect the tradition, you know, like the, the idea of, of this is how this is done. This is the way our government runs like he still seems like he respects that almost to the point of his detriment. So that's why I kind of think that he is staying back and he's allowing the J.O. the DOJ just to run as it should. Yeah, we're I mean, we're going to be tests. We're going to see some tests to that coming up i mean there there will come a time when you know it seems like every president gives the last one a pass and that's the way it's been working uh or else you know the bushes would have been in prison and <laughs> yeah but i mean the bushes committed some light treason to start a war to be able to make more money for the vice president of, yeah. of cheney they both did it for halliburton and cheney i mean that's that's kind of like a presidential thing that like you can kind of give a pass for. It's like, yeah, you got your buddies rich. Fine. You know, that's kind of what politicians do. This is really different circumstances. We're talking about serious sedition and getting aid and comfort from foreign governments. And the more stuff that is no longer able to be covered up by bar and the more stuff that comes to light, the less Biden's going to have to be able to give him a push. And I think the easy way out for Biden in this is just to step back and go, hey, I'm not saying the DOJ can't do this. I'm just not directing them to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing what you're taught in civics class, the Department of Justice is supposed to be, is that the president picks the person and then that's the last time they really deal with it. <laughs> wait, wait, civics classes? What are those? <laughs> those are part of the leftist liberal agenda to right, indoctrinate right. students into this thing that's really bad for America called critical thinking. <laughs> At least when it comes to government. <laughs> and it's, that's somehow related to critical race theory, even though I'm the guy running for governor of Georgia who said it is destroying America and I will sign an executive order on day one banning it, but I cannot tell you what it means. <laughs> I'm just being facetious because we don't really have those here in America because the first thing you want to get rid of is the operating manual for your government so you can keep people from being able to do anything about it. I don't know. I, 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 they teach some of this stuff still in schools. I mean, I had a lunatic government teacher who had a mace that he'd bash the trash can with and then go down to the, the teacher's lounge and steal like cupcake, cupcakes or donuts out of there and then sell them in class to raise for a charity that he was doing stuff. He hated Bill Clinton. And we had a kid in class named Clint, so he always called him Mr. Clinton. Uh, but I don't know if kids have those weird civics teachers anymore i think most of them got tenure and you and i lucked out <laughs> in the age frame that we're at to where the ones that had tenure stuck around and then they either died off or they finally just gave up and retired and that's when civics fully died 
But there was a serious push to remove civics and all of that kind of stuff. Even when we were like little, little, like in the early 80s, there was a lot of that being dropped out and they changed it around and all of that kind of stuff because they didn't want people to think critically. And the easiest way to do it is just to talk about how boring politics are supposed to be. But like if you pay attention, man, a lot of the stuff that people love in their entertainment that keeps them going is just politics of the past. (laughs) You know, like if you if you're watching like fucking Rome and really, really digging it. But then you look at the news and think, oh, all this politics is boring. Uh, It's kind of the same shit, my man. You just aren't paying enough attention. (laughs) And And it's it's your actual life that you're playing with. And if you've looked at an argument underneath a sports story, the arguments are just as ridiculous. So I don't want to hear that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean, even fucking guitar parts. People argue over how many times a pickup needs to be wound and how this one pickup that was made in 1960s with very little QC involved because that's just the way it was. And you never knew what was actually the pickup itself. That's so much better than a pickup that was designed nowadays to replicate that sound with the same elements, but it has quality control to get the right amount of winds for the exact amount of resistance to make it just as loud as it needs to be. Because there was less QC in the 60s, they sounded better. I, I don't know why people argue that, but they do. It's like, you know, people argue stupid shit that they really fucking shouldn't. Look at us. Look at what we're discussing. We're supposed to be talking about Biden's 100 days, and now I'm talking guitar shit. Well, you know, he, he maybe, I don't know, maybe he plays guitar. I think you will like this news. I hear they're getting a cat. Yeah. Uh, have we had it from home? I'm not sure. Have we had a, is it first cat? What's it, first pet? What, what's, what, what are they, first I think dog? they call them first pets. There have been cats in the White House before. Okay. Uh, I think Bill Clinton's cat was named Sox. That but, sounds right. But I think, uh, you know, uh, other presidents before that, I feel like Teddy Roosevelt had a bear or some fucking thing. Uh, I know we're talking about the general idea is it's about 100 days in. You brought up FDR. And that's kind of when people started talking about the first hundred days. As yeah, person. because he is truly the president that did the most in his first hundred days and is the standard by which all other presidents get judged. And that is why that is such a mile marker. I remember reading that in an article shortly after Biden's hundred days ended not so long ago. Merrick Garland is fewer than a hundred days in because I feel like his confirmation went on took forever to get started and then went on forever i watched almost every single minute of it because i am me because you're a masochist when it comes to politics (laughs) you can't get enough but i mean there are some people that are much more enjoyable to watch answer the ridiculous things that Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham and Tom Cotton and uh, Rand Paul or Jim Jordan come up with. Uh, there's some people that are like, I'm way fucking smarter than you. And I have a lot of patience. <laughs> Fauci. You're talking <laughs> Fauci. <laughs> Fauci's a delight to be interviewed by those fuckheads. <laughs> and yeah, it's I mean, obviously, they're the government, so they're going to do some shitty things. But I feel like I'm surprised at there are some things going on, or at least things that have been said. And I think there's a difference between things that are said before the election and things that are said after the election. People seem to, like, cut it off. Like, nobody's talking about how they were talking about there being a public option available to people in health insurance. That's not really getting talked about that much anymore. Of course, he hasn't really done anything involving health care except for... They are talking about letting uh, Medicaid or Medicare negotiate prescription drug prices, which will affect prescription drug prices nationwide. They did say that they support getting rid of the whatever fucking copyright thing that drug companies get to have on drugs that are funded by tax money, but waiving that so other people can make the vaccine to help fight this bullshit. Yeah, that was a WHO initiative that Biden just publicly backed, which is extremely different than what, like, let's get rid of all regulations and take us back to the 1930s and put kids in coal mines Trump was doing. 
he's come up a lot a lot less this la- these last few months but he has me up less at night now that he's some angry old guy in Florida who's got a blog <laughs> dude he's got less than a myspace page it's an angel fire site from like the 90s that he was making <laughs> such a huge deal about it's a wordpress site that somebody threw together for him and then like didn't pay for the url to be anything more than just the wordpress and then slash donald trump's desk or whatever <laughs> seriously it is like the most pathetically put together it's gonna get hacked like if it hasn't already it will be and somebody's gonna do some shit to it that site fucking blows <laughs> It's worse than mine. And, I, <laughs> <laughs> and that's saying something. I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's seriously worse than the first website that I ever built. Like way, way back in the days when MySpace was like a thing. And I thought I was hot shit because I was playing around with HTML. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. There was one website. Or what I for, don't even remember what it was called that we used for one of our first band websites. It was supposed to be really, really easy, and I still couldn't do shit. I I, <laughs> I think the farthest I got on there was I could upload photos from the. Oh, <laughs> uh, dude, it's it's really really bad. It's um the the Creed's blog from uh the office that uh what's sets up for him where it's just a word document that it made it look like an internet link that creed can click on so the creeds it was like creed thoughts backslash blah 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 it was like a fake browser thing and it's just literally creed typing stuff up into a word document and adding photos and thinking it's going on the internet <laughs> last year donald trump asked me how to set up a blog wanting to protect the world from being exposed to trump's brain I open up a Word document on his computer and put an address at the top. I've read some of it. Even for the internet, it's pretty shocking. <laughs> That's what it is. Only somebody actually put it on the internet. <laughs> so that shit show aside, I know we're going to have to deal with it a lot in a couple years. But I, I feel like... Yeah, Yeah, he's entrenching himself in the GOP in a bad way. I mean, look what's happening to Liz Cheney. And I can't believe I'm saying poor Liz Cheney in my head when I'm thinking this. But like the GOP, the entirety of it is turning around on her just because she said, no, that was sedition. No, that was wrong. No, that was treasonous. Yes, Trump is responsible. But they're so desperate and they feel the rats fleeing the ship or dying from COVID on them because they're old age and they don't know what else to do. I mean, that's why they're suppressing votes. That's why they're, they're hitching our wagon onto Trump because it's a totally sinking ship and they feel like the anchor is going to keep them afloat. Right. I mean, he, he has the most charisma out of their party, which is that's, that's fucking horrible to say that. Right. Like, I feel like you're insulting every single one of them, which I'm not saying they don't deserve it, but like, it's such a horrible thing to say. It's like saying that fucking Ringo had the most personality out of all the Beatles. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, it is weird to it's think like, about. Uh, and it's, there are probably more charismatic Republicans that are just less awful, but of their public faces. Okay, there's Lindsey Graham, there's Ted Cruz. Tom Cotton, Mitch McConnell, Josh Hawley, uh, fuck Dan Crenshaw, uh, the Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert. I don't. I thought well, they I, were the same person for like a really long time, dude. <laughs> Seriously, Marjorie Marjorie Greene and Boebert, I thought were the exact same person. I'm like, why does she have five fucking names? One has blonde hair. One has brown hair. I think that's ideologically uh, that's the only difference <laughs> well i was just going by quotes because i've never actually looked at pictures of either of them and they're saying the exact same shit they're reading from the same fucking script yeah i mean i'm sure the what alec the american legislative exchange council writes half their tweets their grassroots thing is showing out to largely be one of those astroturf things where they're spreading out a lot of money from some big donors But, I mean, I don't know. That's fucking... Okay, 100 days-ish. 
<laughs> yeah, let's focus in on the positive stuff for now, if we can, and then we'll talk about the things that we dislike that Biden's doing as well. Yeah, we, we will do that. I, I feel like to for those who weren't with us 100 days ago, four years ago, uh, right around the end of the 100 days, they had tried to get rid of uh, the uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. They tried to get rid of that. And, and John McCain stopped them just in time at that point. And they also had form formulated, but I don't think that they had activated the 2017 Republican tax overhaul. <laughs> Elon How many Musk times had and... Trump go- golfed in his first hundred days? It was every times? fucking weekend. Yeah, it was every yeah. at least every fucking weekend in his every, first 100 it was every days. Every weekend. I mean, he filed for uh his re-election campaign on inauguration day. It was, it was golfing. I won rallies the size of my inauguration. So big rallies. That, that Rolling was... back a bunch of regulations that made people safe and allowed coal companies to dump slag in rivers again and companies like uh Aetnia, the, the out here that does the fucking corn, gasoline, ethanol shit, like, to poison the earth all around them and get away with it. Like, all of the shit that's gone wrong and all the stuff that's making people sick right now, that was all started in the first 100 days. Because d- isn't that when he started unrolling all the stuff for not just the EPA, but also the pandemic task force and shit, too? He was all, it was, like, yeah. super early. He did all that stuff, like, right away. Yeah. So in his first 100 days, he caused... The deaths of nearly six hundred some odd thousand hundred thousand Americans. Yeah, there was uh twenty four executive orders, twenty two presidential memoranda, uh twenty presidential proclamations, and twenty eight bills. Uh, at least half of those, or about half of them. Uh, what? what, what, what. Yeah, I think I've got thirteen of those 28 were rolling back regulations and things that he said he was going to do in his first hundred days, pretty much none of those things happened except for the mean things. Like he, the Muslim ban got started. He got work. Anything racist, cruel, and genuinely would just harm human beings just for the sake of harming them. That's what he did in his first hundred in his first hundred days. But yeah, like we said, we, we kind of lost track of the golf trips because it was every weekend. Uh, <laughs> and that, it's really the I, I can't believe he's allowed to still live down there, but I guess whatever. He's not supposed to be able to live at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> yeah, nobody's happy about that, except for maybe him. <laughs> oh, uh, before we get re- go on to the present, we were talking about uh, other Republican leaders that are less charismatic than he. Kevin McCarthy, who Dick Cheney asked to go hunting with him. I wonder what's going to happen. Are we going to get lucky? (laughs) (laughs) Why can't Dick Cheney go hunting with Mitch McConnell? Unless that was a joke because of all the shit that they're doing to Liz Cheney. But I thought I saw today that Dick Cheney invited him on a hunting trip. That could, I mean, (laughs) saying it out loud... It could very well be a joke, but I mean, Dick Cheney does go hunting and he does go hunting with Republicans. Yeah. And he does shoot his friends in the face and pretend like it's an accident. Yeah. So we'll see. (laughs) Okay. So you, you did initiate this. Let me hear what you got to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my big thing and the thing that was really, really upsetting me and pissing me off was basically pandemic and crisis that was created by the Trump administration and the GOP at the border. And my main focus was, all right, so we need to do something about the pandemic now that you're in effect. And so Biden, what pledged his first hundred days, they were going to have how many, like hundred million vaccinated or something like that. Yes. I can't remember what it was. It was like this ridiculous number that I was like, there's no way he's going to do this. This is all artifice. And then he fucking does it. And he's like, you know what? That's cool, but can we do 200 million? Can we double it before my 100 days are up? And they got close. Did they do it? But they got real fucking close. At the end of March, uh, the BBC said that he doubled the 100 million. One of the things that I had was 
the CDC has us as the U.S. has delivered 235 million vaccine doses. I don't know if that's people, but that's 235 million doses. Well, you can't force people to take the vaccine without really getting into infringing upon their several liberties. But they opened it up and they made a way federally for everybody who wanted to be able to get one extremely earlier than what they were thinking they were going to could get them. Uh, In my state, I don't know how this works for yours, but my governor, who is a complete piece of shit idiot and wants to be the next Trump so fucking hard and he's trying so hard to do it, but he has, like you said, no charisma, no personality, and his head looks like a giant penis, or at least the tip of it. Um, But Ricketts was blocking it. He would not allow federal anything to come in. Like they were going to set up a fucking tent and just start offering it to like really get this going. And Ricketts is like, no, that's fine. And he moved it to all of the areas where all of his supporters were just like fucking Trump did, where the only people that got aid during the actual pandemic were people that were his supporters or would fucking kiss the ring or whatever it was that he wanted. A little gratitude. Well, that's what fucking Ricketts is was doing and he was trying to block that and keep it from getting the vaccines and he was literally blocking Lincoln and Omaha which are like the two biggest population senators or centers he was blocking them from being able to get what they needed and was making sure that there was an overabundance everywhere else in the very rural areas like they just completely took the supply and siphoned it off to everywhere else but the cities where the most people were going to get them And so by the time they made it federally, we're like, okay, they lowered the age federally um, and then started making it to where pharmacies would be able to dish these out to people. And there was a pharmacy program where you could go and and get these. That's when everybody in Nebraska just jumped on those, particularly in those two cities. And that pissed him off so bad. He got so angry about it. And so like it's infringing upon everybody's rights. But all they did was just open up the access that they already offered to every to everybody. And. I don't think my state is the only one that's done that. It's pretty much every fucking state with a Republican governor is having the same thing happen where they are purposely trying to tank the ability of the federal government to respond so that they can go, well, look what's happening in my state. They're not helping us here. But there's records being kept that they can't really lie about because they were like, no, you refuse it. It's right here. You refuse the aid that the federal government was offering you. No additional charge for these vaccines. So. There is oppositions to people getting healthy and getting a vaccine that they need to save their lives in the name of politics happening definitely in my state. And I know it's happening in other states as well. Like, I think they did that shit in Texas somewhere, too. In a lot of places. And I really hate to do this because I hate him so much. But my governor is more like a W. Bush kind of Republican. Where, yeah, make your you friends know, money, but don't harm people to do it unless they're somewhere else overseas and or a darker shade of skin than you. Kinda, I mean, he, he, <laughs> that is, kind of Republican. he is connected to that, uh, I think it's $62 million racketeering bribery case that uh, the former Speaker of the Ohio House resigned from his position. He did not resign from state Congress. He just resigned from being the speaker after he got indicted in this bailout bill they did that was subsidizing coal plants and nuclear power plants, some of them not even in Ohio. And the energy company was involved in this giant bribery thing that is connected to our governor. He pretty much signs anything that has to do with making it harder to get an abortion. He didn't really do anything about religious gatherings, but I mean, last March, early March, he was one of the first governors to cancel like a big thing in the state. And he started really strong. And then he just sort of eh, just give gives it, it. It became there are mask mandates, but there's not really much punishment. And he's not really fr- there's all this uh, rainy day money that they call it saved that they just weren't spending and they're like well we got to get money from the federal government Uh, that sort of republican shit but he yeah we've had the national guard in he's all i mean every day even now he's going on twitter like there are no 
microchips in the vaccine. Please wash your hand. You know, it's he's yeah. at least trying to undo the damage that their party had done because he realized that he's killing off all of his followers. I think the GOP starting to realize that all of their followers are dying because they're they were pushing this anti-vax thing because it made Trump look better or or the anti-mask thing because it made Trump look better as well. If they push those conspiracies, then the reason that Trump wasn't so big on all of that is because, you know, that way it's, you know, part of the deep state plot and you know, blah, 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 whatever it is that they can do to try and make Trump look a little bit better. And he, at least, it sounds like, realized that. I mean, my governor at the very start of everything did the right thing and closed the fucking state down, but then immediately opened it up, like, within just a few weeks. Mm. Like, I think it was, it was like, it was like some kind of recommended thing. And they were like, okay, yeah, that, that three months is good. Let's everybody just open it back up and, uh, you know, start coughing on each other as best you can. And we're all good now. Everything's fine. And then you fast forward like a full like year or so later and boom, <laughs> it's all the same shit. Largely the, like we were saying earlier with the Republican party falling in line behind their figurehead, the great orange monster, fuck him. It's been about 100 days since he's lost that kind of power. The camps are not closed yet. So there have been some reunifications. Well, the investigations are allowed to start happening where people are going in and looking at the conditions. There are repercussions. I've seen certain things in the articles where things are moving and families are starting to be reunited. That was a huge fucking clusterfuck. I understand that that took some time. Yeah, I was real passionate about it, and I was real fucking angry whenever Biden was coming into office. And I was like, he's got to do something now. He's got to do something now. But like, when I sort of stepped back from it, and I'm like, God, how many people? How many in each camp? How many fucking camps? Are they all recorded? We even know where they all are. And then ICE being resistant against it because they feel like they don't have to answer to the president because they don't on an answer to an actual president, a sitting president that needs to be dealt with as well. There's a lot of resistance on that. So I understand that there's been a delay, but just about the time that I'm like, Jesus Christ, when are they going to fucking do something? You know, the next step is being taken. They moved him from this horrific camp to at least a little bit better of a camp because they don't know where their fucking parents are and they can't identify the kids and they're working on it. You know, those kinds of things. There's like incremental little steps doing things at least the way that it traditionally should be done. And bureaucracy is slow and it fucking blows, but at least there is movement on that. And it's the same thing with the pandemic, the first hundred days, tons of vaccines. Like, I mean, that's the biggest thing is killing everyone across the planet practically. And we need to deal with this. I mean, yeah, it's a small part of the population that are actually going to die from it. But this disease is not going to go away and we're not going to reach herd immunity. It's not going to be natural because it has a resistance to herd immunity. We got to do something about that. So the best thing to do is the vaccines. He focused in on that. Once they got that to where the, you know, the infection rates are going down specifically in this nation, which he's in charge of. So I understand why he's doing that. And things started looking good for us. I'm like, wait, we have a vaccine surplus. What the fuck? Look what's happening in fucking India. What about Africa? You know, like I'm, my brain goes there. And what happens the next day, maybe, or two days from that point where I start thinking that obsessively and getting angry at Biden, I see an article that pops up that Biden's authorizing it and he's shipping some stuff out to help out India. And there's aid coming, you know, from other countries all at the same time. They coordinated this stuff together. And in my brain, I'm like, oh, yeah, that takes time to get all the supplies they need for a nation as densely populated as India. People were working on that. Biden is a part of it. Okay, well, I guess I got to give the guy credit there. I can't fucking yell and scream and be pissed. Uh, the next thing that I thought of was um, in the, the first hundred days having to to do with the, the pandemic and and everything like, like that was not just the vaccines and not just the rollback and everything, but it was kind of like, okay, well, what about climate change, right? Like, that's the next thing that's probably going to kill us. It's going to take a lot longer, but that's going to affect the entirety of the planet. Let's let's deal with that. Like, what, when, when, when are we going to put stuff in that? And it was like, oh, yeah, that, that's right. He jumped right back into the Paris Accord and unrolled all that. And then I started going through and finding the different stuff and all of those different rollbacks and weird things that Trump did with executive orders, like pretty much day one. Biden signed a lot of stuff to roll that stuff back because he could. 
you know, or to put it back the way it was. And he has reinstituted or at least tried to reinstitute the pandemic response team and refunded it and did all of that, too. Has he not? Or am I mistaken in believing that? No, I have heard that that is getting set back up. And yeah, it sounds like it was obvious that many government agencies, especially the non funded Trump ones, were left massively unstaffed, you know, especially the dip- diplomatic corps, uh, things that have to do with health, yeah, health care and things like that. So I saw, I cannot pronounce her name. I can't even really remember it right now, but the press secretary, uh, last week she was asked about that and she said that they are working Jen on... Pataki. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Jen Pataki. I think that's yeah. how you say it. Uh, but she said that they are working on putting that back together because obviously this is not going to be the last pandemic. What kind of fucking press secretary is she when she doesn't insult everyone who asks simple, basic, stupid questions that are completely ridiculous and idiotic? Why does she treat them with so much dignity and respect and answer their questions in such a fucking snarky way that it's a bitch slap every time? Why does she do that? What kind of press secretary does that? You're supposed to get indignant and storm the fuck out of there and throw something. Yeah, oh, wait, that's not that's not the normal. And I, I got that wrong. I'm just I'm sorry. Just so much abuse after four years. I, I'm sorry. You got no. The, like I said, like I say almost every episode when somebody apologizes for getting passionate about something. Part, part of the cornerstone of this show is to let my podcasting friends and allies have a place where they can talk about this shit. So that, yeah, by all means, passion is good. Passion is good. All right. Because... So we we're back in the, we're back in the Paris climate accords. Uh, Biden is working in some green new deal stuff into his infrastructure plan uh, he's pushing something for solar for that, that desert in California where they wanted to put in like a big solar thing that would really take care of like energy for like a good bulk of the grid for America. There's like a big solar farm that like he funded or put something like he got funded or did something to make sure that that got to put into place. Um, the infrastructure plan is essentially FDR part two though. Right? Like, I mean, as far as what I could tell from reading it, it's very similar to the original new deal and our infrastructure plan that they were trying to get up against or butt their heads against whether for the GOP was trying to stop is very like what I could understand is very similar to that. It feels to me like Biden is almost looking at FDR the way that Trump looked at Andrew Johnson. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like where he's like, okay, I'm inheriting the exact same kind of world that FDR kind of got at that time so i need to do the same kind of responses and it seems like and i don't want to say it's like a direct one-to-one playbook but it's pretty fucking close so far it's it's i feel like there's some messaging in the in the party that will lean towards that and i know it's getting some uh comparisons to that partly because nobody's really done fuck all about infrastructure for so long that the the Republican Party still is like, well, this isn't pipes. If it's not pipes, it's not infrastructure. And it it is one of the things that is more aggressively progressive. There's more focus on clean energy, renewable energy. I know the the argument against that is we need to become energy independent by drilling for oil. Because we obviously don't get wind or sunlight. Or, <laughs> or, <laughs> right, or geothermal or uh, any other type of renewable energy that is so much easier to use and not based on putting more carbon into the atmosphere to warm our climate and kill us. Yeah, and, and I like how he worked in, in his little almost State of the Union thing, but it wasn't technically State of the Union because I think that has to be after the first year. Um yeah, it's the 100 days like, OK, this is what I did. Can we can we can we get like a whoop whoop? <laughs> That's basically what that speech was. I think he does sort of seem to have that vision of America where he thinks that he can work with Republicans and things like that, because, I mean, he is he was like my fifth choice. Or something like that for president, but 
He said, you know, there's no reason why yeah. the propellers for our wind turbines can't be built in Pittsburgh instead of China. I feel like that was a definite, you see, fucking people, this is a good idea sort of thing. Well, see, when Trump was talking about let's do America first, what he really meant was dog whistling for KKK, like let's let's do KKK. Let's let's make American for Americas, like Americans, you know, that kind of bullshit is what he was trying to do whenever he was talking about that. He was running on a populist platform saying what's about the population. It's about the little guy. You know, that's what we're going to do. We're trying to make America great again. And he didn't do fuck all for anybody except for the super ultra fucking rich. That's the America that he cared about. And then everybody that's in the GOP was all about that. Biden comes in and he's like, all right, look, uh, bridges are collapsing. All over the country, pipes are bursting and also poisoning, you know, poor people with lead in Michigan. Um, roadways everywhere suck. Our railways are completely desperate and just falling apart. And rail cars are something that I'm really into. And by the way, it's a great mode of transportation. He's like, the main solution now is to move as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, back and forth across the country. And he's all about the bullet train, man. That seems to be the thing that he wants to do. And like you were saying, he does go on to kind of tell us, like, it's not like the rail systems that these cars are going to run on have to be shipped over from another place in the, the world. We have this metal here. We have the foundries. We have the people that will work those jobs, you know? And he all but was like, I mean, like, I feel like he was just saying, we can get some people together and make these workers, like, form a group and the workers will have the power. Like he just felt like he was like so close to going Norma Ray on some of the stuff in some of his speeches where I'm like, are you, are you winking at unions? Is that what you're doing? I, I don't know how exactly to phrase it. Like, you know, that, that I, I, it's almost like dog whistling to that, you know, almost <laughs> where he's like hinting at that, you know, but like dog whistles has such a negative connotation. So it felt more like, um, he was just kind of, in the speech, he was just kind of like winking and nodding to it. Like the things that made America a great country and the things that made America strong and what made America, what America is, is the fact that the workers unite and build, you know, like things like that. He was saying things like that, like where he's literally like focusing on how the working man or, you know, the working person, the, the people that are on the ground building these things are what build things strong not the person that supervises it and oversees it. Like, I felt like that's where his focus was, was shifting. Like he's trying to get people to realize like, you know, let's do this. Like this Amazon warehouse, let's fucking unionize this. Like, I feel like that's what he was kind of winking at when he's doing this shit, but maybe I, I'm just over reading into it. I don't know. It's going to be one of those, ev like we, like we should do. And like we have done, it's going to be one of those rolling evaluations I think it's good. I don't really like who some of the people that he put in charge of, like the Fed, uh, Janet Yellen. I think that's Commerce Secretary. I, I can't remember where she was, but she was actually somebody. She hasn't done anything bad yet, but in the past she supported some shitty ideas. And she was actually one of the failed promises from Trump's first 100 days was that he was going to reinstate her. And he never did. But, yeah, I mean, Transportation Secretary uh, Buttigieg is also really into trains. And... <laughs> hey, tra trains are fucking cool, especially bullet trains, you know? Yeah, and I don't know if you've got one in uh, Nebraska, but here in Ohio, there's been a rail, a lot of rail advocacy groups, but there's one that's really into it, and they've been working slowly and slowly, and then as it seemed like right after... Biden and Buttigieg got in place, they're really ramping up and really supporting and working on the, the Amtrak and the connection because, uh, you know, we have trains. I think it's Pacific. Pacific Railways or whatever is, like, headquarters here. Like, um, okay. and Omaha was one of the big, like, it, it was like, I mean, it's pretty much the dead center of the country. So when railroads were first being built and uh, the indigenous peoples were being slaughtered to put the railways in place... This was like the mark where like if they got here heading uh, west, that meant that they, you know, but at a certain time that meant that they were beating the people working from the west coast to, to close it in. Because the whole thing was it was a gimmick. They were racing to meet in the middle. 
And, you know, the further one could get versus the other meant that they were the winner, you know, and like Omaha was like one of the marks. And so the, the Pacific Railway is like big here. There's a lot of jobs and there's a lot of rails, but mostly it's dead. Mostly the, the train stations here are super fucking scary, you know, when they used to be grand and, and glorious. And I think if we could get people transit where they could take a train across the country in a, about the amount of time it takes you to fly sit there and wait at an airport for a connecting flight and go somewhere else, you know, because that still takes like what, eight hours, give or take to fly across the country like that. If you get a layover. Yeah. If you can drive or if you can get a a rail, like a hyperloop or or some kind of speed train that from one side of the country to the other in about eight to 12 hours, that's pretty fucking amazing. You know, like I think if people could get that, I think they would do it because there's so many of us Midwest and I'm, I don't want to be in this anymore, but I, I guess I am, but there's so many Midwesterners that are like, yeah, 12 hours. I can drive that. That's no big deal. Why fly? You know? So like if they can ride a rail and be like completely across the country and that's 12 hours you drive from Omaha, you're probably going to get to like just to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you know, if you're really booking. So that just to give you an idea. So if you can go from one end of the country to the other in eight to 12 hours, I think that totally is worth it. I know the hyperloop that has been proposed for here estimated you could get from here in Columbus to Chicago in a half hour. Yeah, that's fucking amazing because that's what, like a seven to eight hour drive at least. It's like a nine and a half hour drive to New York City right now. Uh, But the trains that they're talking about doing right now. It would be like Columbus, there would be routes in from Pittsburgh and elsewhere, but Columbus, there would be, you know, Cleveland, Cincinnati, uh, other Pittsburgh, and I'm not sure, possibly something like Columbus to, to well, you know, they're trying to make it nationwide, which would be really cool. I, I am all about that. I hate the highways. They're very stressful to me. I've spent a lot of time on them. You know, I had parents with a van and then I was in a band for fucking ever. So I've I've been across the country. And I think trains are a really interesting way to be able to travel as is anyway, because it's, you know, you're already on the ground. The, the, the motion, once the speed gets going, you can move about the train and everything's neat. You know, you can you can do what you need to do. And if they're like the regular trains that I've taken, you can get your own little like sleeper car, you know, that's like super tiny and compact and you're out of the way from everybody. And if you don't want to, you know, be near anybody, you just stay in that fucking little room that you paid a little extra for, you know, (laughs) yeah, first class kind of. Yeah. And I I think that's I, I think that's a really good method of travel that we've really kind of neglected and we haven't tried to develop because it doesn't really burn enough fossil fuels and doesn't really make enough money for the big wig fat cats like it used to. That's where air traffic came into play. Everybody just found that super convenient. And yeah, until we can put, you know, a hyperloop that goes, you know, under the ocean to another, (laughs) to another continent, which we probably wouldn't be able to do because of tectonic plates and all of that kind of shit. That would be really bad until we can do that, you know, flying across the ocean. Obviously that makes sense, you know, but it's, it's, whatever um yeah so like for the most part i've got i can't really like i'm trying to think of something seriously i'm trying to think of something that that the biden administration in the first 100 days or at least these the 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 current party in power the democrats have done that i really disagree with and i'm like super angry about right but like so far all of the policies they're enacting i never thought i would hear politicians be like no 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 Let's 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 build up some infrastructure. Let's talk, you know, high speed rail. Uh, let's build that stuff, you know, and, and get it done in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we can have the, the steel girders because the foundries still exist. We just need to shake some of the rust off, you know, like that, that kind of like that kind of talk is when the phrase putting America first is stated made me feel like, well, yeah, if you build this stuff here, you are creating jobs. And because it's government funded, it's going to be overpaid for, like, it's going to be paid too much for anyway. So why not put that money into the pockets of the, you know, average worker of America that's doing their thing? You know, the, the tax uh, stuff that we're talking about that, like, everybody's getting all up in arms with, um, what is it, 400000 for a single person and 500000 for a married couple? Or seven hundred and fifty thousand. I think for a married couple, it's uh, five hundred and twenty thousand 
file. Okay, so it's jointly. yeah. Okay, yeah. So that would be assuming that you know one person wouldn't be making a grossly large amount. Like say, like if one person's making four hundred thousand and the other one's making like a hundred thousand, it would almost be easier for them just to have the hundred thousand person to quit. So that they can avoid some of the higher tax rate, <laughs> whatever. <Yeah>. Uh, <laughs> but like the the numbers that they're they're throwing out for like the the higher tax rate and moving these tax rate ups, these tax rates up and everything, it's really interesting to see the pushback on this because when they describe it and when they say what it is, it seems like like even Republican voters are like, no, that that sounds about right. That's good. Like I, I haven't seen too many. They're like, no. Don't fucking tax four hundred thousand dollars. No, that's wrong. You know, like the the estate taxes and things that they're looking to push. I can see where like super rich people that are you know bound to inherit like Bill Gates' kids. I can see where they're super pissed about that, and they'd right. be super upset and they'd be really really worried. I could see where that's the case, but like I was really shocked seeing the poll numbers and seeing even like you know different people that were interviewed on whatever news cycle I was involved with there are actual republican voters that are like no that that sounds good yeah let's do that cuz they're starting to get it it feels like the pandemic kind of not necessarily woke the people up but it really shine like shone like a huge fucking spotlight on the income inequality and the wage slavery that is this nation right there does seem to be a lot I feel like a lot of people spend a lot of a lot more time actually looking at things and thinking about things rather than just, you know, another part of the American system is you don't know if you're going to have a vacation. You know, it's everybody. You know, a lot of people are working two jobs or one job so much. And there's not enough time. It's, it's and your job is tied to your or your health care is tied to your job. So, I mean, that, uh, that, well, that's a whole other thing, but. Oh, no, no, let's, let's, let's unpack this. All right. Okay. Let's, let's be frank and honest. Okay. All right. Capitalism currently is the thing that America is all about. And it's kind of the thing that America was sort of founded on. But the thing is the exploitation of the worker used to be straight up fucking slave labor there was a war literally fought over this and they stopped that so they had to find another way to exploit the worker to be able to get two three dollars out of them for paying them two three dimes the way that they did that is they literally paid them two three dimes and they had them making things worth two and three and four dollars Started fights about that. We started getting unions formed, and then the working man started getting part of. And when I say the working man, it's just the the typical phrase, the working human. <laughs> I'm trying to be a little more <laughs> inclusive here. I'm sorry, but like the person that's doing the actual physical labor, the actual worker started getting more of the wage per hour, and really, really fought for it. And like the the collective bargaining started making that happen to where. You couldn't force someone to work seven days a week. We had a forty hour work week, and that was the max. Anything over that was time and a half like there were serious bloody battles fought for all of this and every single one of these things put in place made what happened in like the 40s and the 50s with america actually really kind of expanding because we had living wages the idea of the minimum wage or the living wage was a human being could work a single job at this livable minimum wage and still be able to afford a home and food and to support a family. It was supposed to be one worker. That was the idea because that was the idea of the nuclear family. Now, the idea for minimum wage that they're trying to sell us now is taking it back to the, you get two dimes while the boss makes $3 on you. That's all they want to do. And the way that they're doing that, the way that they're making this wage slavery happen is they continue to keep the minimum wage as low as they possibly can and only raise it begrudgingly when they think there's going to be another general strike. Then they raise it just enough to just appease the people and get them back to work. And the way that they found to tie this is, well, you already don't have enough money and you can't afford to stay healthy and stay alive. So now you are literally having to work for them under penalty of death from whatever health issues you may or may not have that could possibly arise or your family and those that you love. So you need to keep coming back to this job and you need to keep kissing that boss's ass and you need to keep doing this work and you can't fucking strike 
because your kid could fucking die. Your wife could fucking die. And the only way you can keep them healthy is to keep in this job just so you can have that insurance. That's why I'm a fucking wage slave where I am. That's why I haven't just fucking left because I have to keep the health care for myself and my wife. The reason they don't want Medicare for all, the reason they don't want that isn't just the insurance industry and what they're doing to push that. I mean, their lobby's very powerful and they're keeping that going. And the same thing with the healthcare industry that we currently have that's healthcare for profit, which is a whole other level of fucking exploitation. I mean, that's fucking extortion in my book, right? Your health can only be kept up if you pay me this ridiculous amount of money. Oh, you broke your arm? Well, you're shit out of luck unless you pay me this ridiculous amount of money to get it fixed. The only difference between that and a guy going out and busting kneecaps is the kneecap got busted before he got there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's what they're doing. They're wage slaving the fuck out of us because they can and they can get away with it. But when the pandemic happened and they had to begrudgingly give some of these far folks unemployment because they can't work under actual penalty of death... A lot of them started realizing that those jobs that they were working aren't worth the money that they were being paid. That that heartache and that stress that they were going through wasn't worth the wage theft that they were going through. And you know what? The unemployment's got them for the health care because they have a certain Medicare right now, too. So that fear is gone. And there's all these fucking like dollar stores and restaurants and all these other fucking wage slavery institutions that are forcing every single person that works for them to work for literally nothing just so they can barely stay alive and scrape by and get more debt to those fucking institutions. The only reason that the only power that they had, like once people realized what it was that they were doing now, dollar store and McDonald's and all these other fucking restaurants that are paying people shit, they can't get workers because they got better resources and their families being better taken care of than what they would at at a uh, uh, fucking working at Burger King. So they just say, you know what? I'm not going to work. They don't go there. And the more people that realize this, the more people that do this, if we could actually like uh, human beings in this country could actually somehow, I don't know, just collectively get together and what's the word I'm looking for? Bargain, like collectively bargain. Like if they um, join, join together, like, a, uh, like a, uh, um, when you join things, you, you unite them. They unite. There we go. If we, oh, well, that's not good for that many people. What would you call a group of people that collectively bargain and are united, man? What would you call that? The type of people that want to make a general strike against uh, the evils of capitalism. Yeah, like, like everybody gets together. They generally strike. They're united, and they work together for collective bargaining to make sure that they are taken care of and given a living oh. union. Union, union, uh, right? Let's, let's... An amalgamation, uh, an alliance. <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's the next logical step. And I got to say, as much as people give millennials and zennials or whatever it is, the, the younger and younger crop of workers that are that are coming up, the, the, the 20 year olds that are just getting out of college and the high school kids that have just graduated that are starting to enter an actual workforce and looking to get an apartment and just make ends meet, and, you know, take care of themselves and just fucking start their lives as adults. They're seeing the scam. They're seeing right through it. And so it's a real interesting time to be alive. It really fucking is. So I don't know, man. It's it's a good mark for the first hundred days because it feels like everybody at least is kind of coming together in the same direction. And the only people that are resisting it are the QAnon fanatics, the GOP craziness, and their fucking cult. But there's so many more, like even GOP voters that like the uh, irrational thoughts and they kind of got their shit together, you know, there are some very popular things that look closer than they have in quite some time to being actuated. Now I think, yeah, like I said, we're, we're going to have to wait and see because still most of this is stuff. Somebody's saying they want to happen. And the overwhelming sense of dread that I had four years ago today when we were doing this <laughs> you know or eight years ago or no four years ago today it could whatever like it was years, yeah yeah it felt like 72 my man but uh the, the overall sense of dread that i had has has lifted a little bit my general disdain for humanity uh and the and the my fellow americans it's not necessarily lifted but i have a sense of hope that I have not had for a really, really long time. And that's the major crow that I have to eat. 
So, and I know he listens to this stuff, at least just to make sure that nobody's talking shit about him. So, Bo, dude, I said I would admit to it if it happened. And that's why I wanted to do this hundred days. I have some hope. I, I have some hope. I want everyone to like, get that in their head. Me, the eternal pessimist has some hope. That's good to hear. That's it's it's easier to keep fighting for good things when there's hope. And damn, did we did we just end the episode? I I can't think of a better place to end it. I mean, just throw up a poster of me with the word hope like they had for Obama. <laughs> no, that would be wrong. Don't do that. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, that no, that would be. You, you well, can name I'll, the. I'll you make can... one and you'll look at it and we'll decide. <laughs> I just feel like that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we'll we'll change it to a cinema a synonym a little bit of a synonym of hope perhaps but i definitely have that filter put me on a fucking union poster that'd be cool i got it all out i got everything that i needed to say and the fact that i have hope is pretty much my closing so i mean what is it don't forget to duck and cover don't let them take you to a second location <laughs> i'm trying to remember all the slogans you used to have it uh, yeah, uh, get the duct tape on the windows. I know it's a uh, hundred days is a relatively arbitrary thing, but it's traditional. And God damn it, we're gonna do now. Um, I think, yeah, fuck it. I don't know. We're here. We talked about it. <laughs> you do sound a lot more optimistic than you did last time. Yeah, yeah. I I had some some soul searching and I I did some fact finding and some reading and various things like that and I seriously I was trying to find something, dude. My pessimism, I was like the shoe's going to drop. The shoe's going to drop. The shoe's going to drop. I'm just waiting. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and then when the shoe got tied down, it became tighter, fit a little bit better and then started doing a little like tap dance. <laughs> I was like, "Oh. Well, maybe there is something to look forward to and the longer this 100 days went on the more of the things that i was like well what about this what about that like i i, I tried to keep a catalog of it because i told bo that i would do it on on air and everything that i can think of that i kept in the index of my angry fucking brain about well they better do something about this they better do something about that there was movement and then when there was movement i'm like okay well what now there should be more movement and just about then there's been more movement but the problem is the country is so fucking hyper fucked when trump left that it's gonna take for a good portion of biden's presidency to undo that and fix it but he has so much other stuff that he needs to do so i think throwing all these different irons in the fire and having all these people working on all of these things is probably a good thing because he's probably got focus pulled in a million different directions and the main thing that that administration needs to focus in on right now is getting us all vaccinated, getting us all to stay alive, making sure that we're all treated and then move forward from that point. And I feel like that's on track and that that machine is running and they're allowing the healthcare professionals to do what they need to do. Um, had the pandemic response team not been destroyed, it might have moved even fast, faster. But uh, considering that it went from zero to holy fuck. 200 million people vaccinated almost in the first 100 days. That's incredible. <laughs> you know, so, hey, <laughs> I I have hope. Yeah, we'll see how he deals with ICE. We'll see what happens with the infrastructure plan. We'll see what happens with the PRO Act, which is the workers' rights and unionization. And we'll see what happens with voters' rights. I feel like those are the big main main things. But yeah, it's like general government gripes right now. For me, nothing that I'm more optimistic than I thought I was going to be at this point. I'm at the point now where I am literally like going after local officials and my governor and things like that here in my state. I give no fucks about the state that I live in. This is just where I landed because this is where my then girlfriend, now wife, went after college because she had a job. You know, that's just that's all Nebraska is to me. I've lived here for way too fucking long and I still fucking hate the state. <laughs> but like I willfully was like, yeah, let it destroy itself as long as I can take care of myself. It's fine. But I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, well, I got nothing else to obsess about and be pissed over. So I guess I'll just turn my attention to this fucking dickhead looking motherfucker. That's what's yeah. happening because <laughs> I have hope now. 
And you're you're gonna have to give me some. I don't. I'm. You're gonna have to tell me some movie characters that he's like. If if you need some of that <laughs> alternative photography, because other than putting him into anti government anti marijuana government propaganda videos, I'm a little dry <laughs> on his character. Yeah, look at all the other states across the country that have already made it legal. You're gonna kill your kids. What a fucking jump. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, all those things that he said. Uh, don't forget to duck and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you duck and cover. End of flashback. This will keep it quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com, or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now... Back to the cutting room. <laughs>